Um, so well, welcome back, everyone. This is the long overdue continuation of the uh, Tidyverse introduction talk. Um, I'm not going to go over a lot of what I've said before, but just to bring you up to speed, basically, I'm giving an example. Tidyverse is a huge collection of, of our packages. Um, for working with data. The nice thing about them is they have a consistent usage and a consistent philosophy, um, which makes them very nice to use together. And uh, very popular, might I add, too. So we've talk talked about ggplot before, which is the plotting portion of Tidyverse. And then this is the data wrangling portion of part Tidyverse. So a big part of uh, being a data scientist is getting your data into the format you need. So that involves working with real world data. There's always problems and combining data from multiple sources. Um, so we're doing a bit of a, a crazy example here of, uh, of pulling in data. In this case here, I, I just picked, this was something I was personally interested in. Um, I had the Canadian flight supplement, which is a list of all the aer aerodromes or places you can land airplanes in Ontario. Um, and they, the uh, Transport Canada, or NAV Canada, I guess, supplies a PDF file of all this information, but there is no textual format if you want to do any sort of work on it. Like, for example, plot where all these air, airplanes uh, landing spots are. Um, although that information is included in it, here's we've got the GPS coordinates. There's all sorts of good information in here, and we'd like to be able to bring this in so we can actually do some data analysis on it. Um, so I ran a program, there's in the popular utils, which is a PDF package for Linux, there's a PDF to text, um, which will give you the text, and it tries to reconstruct paragraphs and stuff, but it fails miserably in this case, because this is highly structured, uh, visually structured or layout structured data. Um, it does a good job if it's just paragraphs. So instead, you can export it in a TSV mode where it just exports a TSV file. And then for each word, it uh, gives you a bounding box for that word and what the text is. So that's our input. And then we're going to use the tidyverse to clean that up and produce uh, something that we can actually use in our analysis. So last time we got down to this point here, um, we were just working on our, our list of aerodromes. And uh, this is a big file, about 400 pages of it are aerodromes. So there's a lot of a lot of rows and stuff in here. Um, and we had extracted out the list of aerodromes. So I'm going to just jump back over here. I've got a running R session, which I've just started. So just go back to the start of my file here, um, and we'll run these lines. So we import the tidyverse library, which is actually a, a large combination of sublibraries. Um, we set a little wider print there. We uh, set our file name. We read in the file. Um, so this is all stuff that was done before. You can watch the previous talks. Uh, we get the input lines, split off the, the headers on the top. So that would be this section here, because not all of the lines in this file, so any of the stuff about that, are about aerodromes. Like if we jump towards the end of this document, so say I jump forward to page 500, um, I'm in the general section. So only the first 477 pages or so are actually aerodromes. Um, and then we figure out what the, the headers are. So we build those back up again, all in the first talk. Some more work there. Uh, and then we look for this aerodromes facility directory to identify the subset of pages we want. So we pull out that set of pages there. Um, and we pull that set of pages out of the headers because we we don't we've that's the set we want. And it's very useful sometimes to, and I mentioned this in the prior talk too, is to always look at the complement of which you take out, because then that shows you what you missed. You do that command the first time and then you look at the complement and you're like, huh. Yeah, there's some, you know, maybe some spelling mistakes in this header on some pages or stuff like that that messes up your data. Um, so then we pull the pages from there we want and input we want, and we're just working our way back up to where we were here before. Uh, and then we then we do some work on this page too. So we group the various words into lines. We'll be going over how we do, did that again. 
And then we coalesce all the lines into chunks. So chunks are basically columns. So we'd split this here into one line and one chunk. And this here would become its own line and its chunk. Um, and now what we're looking for in here is actually, so we're, we've, we've extracted just the aerodome facility directory pages. And now we're actually just trying to identify the aerodome. So that's this top uh, header line here. And uh, this is almost back to where we do. We just do that on the left-hand side here and the right-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we match this magic uh, format, which is all the Canadian airports are assigned a code that starts with C and it's four letters long. Pull that in. And then when we actually look at the data, uh, it turns out there are a bunch of specialty ones, which are what these codes are, and they are buried in here, but they're not actually places you can land. They are flight service stations, so that's to do with weather reporting and stuff. So we strip those out by their special codes here. This bit of code does, um, which is where we left off. So I'll run this last line there. There. And now we've caught back up to where we were. Uh, we can have a look at our aerodrome code here. And basically now at this point, we've generated a table that has the page numbers and a line number we don't really care about. Um, and then the names, we've extracted the name of the aerodrome and we have extracted the, uh, the Y cut off point here. So that's the magic line that's underneath it here. Um, and now I should mention here, because this will come up as well, there are not in this particular sample file, this was a sample file I downloaded from somewhere. So it's an old, old copy. But if you go look onto the, the Nav Canada page where they sell this electronic document, um, there is, these strokes right here, there is a, um, sorry, I'm used to the floating monk's cursor. If I open up the new sample here, in the new sample, they have they have compressed it somewhat by uh, like in this one here, you can see there's just a bunch of empty space. So if there was enough room, they've actually squashed them on multiple ones onto the same page. So we have to deal with that as well. Because I actually do ultimately want well, my intent. I haven't done any more work on this, <laughs> uh, but my intent was to be able to uh, to to run on the newest version because that's the actual information I was interested in. Um, so the first thing here we're going to do, so if we jump to our next page here, this, so this is where we are. Um, we're gonna remove the aerodome header. So basically we're gonna strip, we've already stripped the top header out here. So um, this bit is gone from the past. So now we've identified where these are. So we're just gonna remove this bit of text from our general input. Um, how do we do that? Well, that's pretty simple. We have the, I guess I lied. I said we didn't need the line number, but we do need the line number. We've got the line number that that was associated with on it. So we just anti-join. So that brings two pieces of data together. So again, we're taking our pages table. Let's have a look at that. Pretty much. Pages, uh, and we're going to print it for, we'll just print out the first, uh, Uh, we'll print out the first eight lines, say. There we go. And then we will also print out the first eight lines of our aerodrome. Or actually, I guess we have our aerodrome up there, but we don't, we'll, we'll print out the first eight lines of that. So, aerodromes. We're just going to join these two tables together. So that takes the common columns, if I haven't specified anything else. So in this type, that's page and line number, and uh, puts those two tables together. And we're performing an anti-join. So there's different types of joins, left, right, uh, full join, inner join. An anti-join basically is a join with the complement. Um, so what I'm left with is any lines of pages that did not match any lines in Aerodome. So 
uh, basically I'm going to eat the this page and this line number out of all those list of air, of uh, of the aerodromes files. Um, you can see ahead here we had Ajax Pickering General Hospital, which was this bit of text here. So we'll run this uh, lines command here, this pages command. Sorry. Here we go. And now if we have a look at pages, um, we have stripped out uh, this particular this one line here in it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to recompute our line. So here's our, our magic line formula here. Um, so we're going to just arrange our, our data by the page, the line, the chunk, and the x0, x0 being the bottom left-hand side of the bounding box. Um, and then, so if we look at the pages here, then, then we're going to uh, group it by the page, the line, and the chunk. So every call every row here like this is all the same page this is all the same well, only the first one's line but let's look at these ones where line was three these all belong to the same line and uh ref is a, it's on its own column but if we look over at n 43 50 10 w 79 that is all together that has the same chunk number assigned to it so we're going to apply this operation here which flattens the string so it's going to take Basically, if I want to highlight these particular lines here, uh, these all have the same identical value of, of the um, of my grouping operations. Page, line, and chunk are all the same value on these lines, so they get into one group. And then we run the string flatten command on text, where text is the vector of text values here. So that just combines them all together. And then we compute new bounds as well. So new x0 is the minimum of the, the vector of x zeros, and x1 is the max and stuff. So we just basically compute a new bounding box uh, for this particular entry here. So we'll just basically have a boundary box here that goes around them like that. And we'll have combined all that text together. Let's actually get the particular lines. There we go. Um, and now we have it sort of broken down as I said. So we combine these. So we got this all. Each line is on its own. And then what we're going to do is in, in looking at this data here, you'll notice there's this ONCEP2. Um, and you won't actually find that anywhere on the page, but it's there. So I'm just going to undo some of this, this nasty markup I've done on my page here. But if I do a search in here, O N C E P P, sorry, O N C P E P, um, you can see it's right there. And what they have on all these pages, for whatever reason, printed in white text, they have the words O N O N uh, C P E two. So this is an example of the data messiness that just slows you around because uh, I certainly didn't see that the first time, and then these came in and messed up various things such as my searches for CPE2 and things like that. Um, so we're just going to get rid of those invisible lines and uh, let me jump back to the next page here. How do we do that? This is pretty easy. We take our, our table here of lines, we feed it in uh, just to review. So this pipe operation basically uh, unnests a data statement. So unnest your first argument basically. So this here is the exact same thing. All the pipe does is it applies it as the first argument to the next statement, uh, which it seems pretty trivial, but it's actually tremendously useful because uh, then you kind of read this like a person would read it, right? You say, oh, we take lines, we put it into this mutate, we take the result of that, we put it into the inner join. Um, so if I actually wanted to expand this full thing out without using the pipe symbol, then my code is going to look like this. Well, the first operation of this is the mutate. And then the first operation of the next line, the filter, is that. And to actually read this resulting code, and I'm not going to actually do it all because it's, it's dreadfully horribly long. Um, oops. Oh. 
So there is the equivalent of the first few lines, right? And to actually read this, you have to read it from inside. So you're like, okay, we're mutating, aerodome, blah, blah, blah. And then that's going into an inner join and the arguments for the inner join are down here somewhere. And then that's going into a filter and then the arguments for the filter are down there. So we don't read stuff from inside out. We read it from left to right and top to bottom, at least in the, the, uh, the English language here that this is in. Um, so basically this simple little pipe allows you to decompose that ugly mess of inside out into a nice left to right, top to bottom and make it a lot easier to read. Um, so that's actually an example of something that's pretty trivial, but at, I, I mean, I'm sure it's not trivial to implement, <laughs> but it uh, it's trivial to understand, but it sure makes your code a lot nicer to read. And there you see a lot of that sort of attention to detail in the tidyverse. Um, so anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the lines and we're going to um, calculate. So uh, let me see, mutate, erdom. Yes. So we're going to look at each of these lines and we're going to create a, a new value here. And what we're doing is we are matching this string. So string extract can run a regular expression. Um, so we're looking for a string that starts with A to Z, uh, has two characters. So that's the province coding. And then an optional space. So again, there's something that bites you. This particular one doesn't have a space, but uh, some of them do have spaces. Um, and then C, and then three of the, the airport codes, so like PE2, so A to Z, capital A to Z or zero to nine, and then that's the end of the string. Um, and then we're going to uh, take the first group from that. So that's the first bracketed term. Uh, normally it returns the entire match string, but in this case, I want the first bracketed term. So I'm just gonna throw away the ON, the ON suffix here and keep the CPE2. Um, we can see this here, just throw a print statement in here. Another nice thing about tidyverse uh, is they have a, a sort of rules for functions. So there, there's functions that compute new values. So mutates, of, in my opinion, a poorly named function, uh, just coming from the world of pure programming, because usually mutate means you're modifying the data structure. But in this case, they actually compute a new table and add this column to it. So the original uh, table of lines is left unaltered. So it's not actually a mutation in the uh, programming sense of a mutation. So we'll just print out, uh, we'll say we'll print out four lines. So functions that do not perform, do not calculate uh, that just have side effects is what they would call this here. They return the original input. And what that lets you do is that lets you throw them into a list of items like this. So lines, print is just going to print it. That's just a side effect. It doesn't change the data, but it returns the data, which then lets me feed that back into the mutate call for the actual aerodrome. So you can sprinkle statements like print and to write the CSV and stuff, you can you can sprinkle them into these pipes and they just work as, a, as, as you would expect. So let's have a look at this. So here's the table before, um, and then you can see, as I said, it matched this particular line, matched that, and it added a CPE2 value to the aer new aerodome variable. Uh, now, built into R is a support for um, not missing values, statistical language, and that's an important part of statistics. So it has a built-in NA support. So that's a missing value on all the data. So ones that didn't match the string um, it just got assigned an NA value. So, and then we're going to perform an inner join. Um, the inner join takes two arguments. So the first argument, of course, is, is this table here coming in from the, uh, from the mutated where we calculated the aerodome. And we're going to inner join it with our list of aerodomes. So if we print that out, let's just print out that. Uh, so we'll just print out three lines of this one or four lines of this one as well. Uh, so it's going to match these two tables up. Inner join is going to only return lines where there is a match. Um, and the only comments we got are going to match on page, we'll match on line, um, and we'll match on aerodome being the common uh, columns. Well, sorry, let me state that again. 
I'm actually running a select error domes, error dome comma Y. Um, so basically I'm taking my error dome table and I'm only selecting the error dome line and the Y line. So uh, that is, I won't have the page in line. So those will not be part of my selection. Um, so to just to go back here and throw that in here too. So select error dome. Selecting here again. Arrow. And so we're taking this table here and we're joining it with this table up here. So the only matching column is going to be the error dome column. So basically, wherever there's an error dome column that matches, we're going to, what the result of that will be, we'll be adding this Y value. We can see that here too. Let me just leave both prints in. That's fine. So now we've picked up the error dome. We picked up the y value, which, if you remember right, the y value was the uh, the, the the bottom line underneath uh, this one. And the reason we're propagating that is because on the newer versions of this input file, there's multiple ones of this per page. Um, so that was a real additional pain. Take these right here. So, and then what we're doing here is, uh, is we have this filter command. So we're taking values, we're filtering out values. If we look at X zero um, and aerodome X zero, uh, then these two values have to be within four. Um, so these near functions, as I mentioned before, are you use them because uh, it's a basically an, a, a quality comparison for floating point numbers. Um, because floating point rounding error often means you wind up with differences, even though in a pure sense of the world, there shouldn't have been a difference. So they provide a near function that it lets you um, that lets you say that they match if they are. Um, and so, and Y1 is less than Y is less than 10. So we want the, the lines here, Y1 being the bottom, uh, sorry, the bottom right, the bottom bound here. So the bottom bound, uh, the difference from this bound here is less than 10. Changes here. On the entire code there. You can see the table. Um, and the basically what this has done is this has extracted out the uh, the the page and the line and the chunk number that corresponds to this invisible bit of, of text up in the uh, the right hand side there. Um, and then we're gonna take from our pages, we're gonna anti-join them with invisible. So we're just gonna erase this bit of text. Uh, and a lot of the pain in the, due to this one here again, was because of this, the, the newer format where they put multiple ones per page. So we couldn't just look in the upper left corner and delete it, right? Because we don't actually, if there's multiple ones per page, the, the precise location of the second one is not well-defined. Uh, so anyways, so that was a bit of a, a pain, which is why they say actually for the data scientists, the, the majority of their time is spent on the data wrangling phase, which is just trying to clean up the data, not so much the analysis. Uh, so to talk about what was new here, the string extract function um, extracts on a match. And again, this is a vectorized function. So uh, with tidyverse, when it runs these sort of mutate commands, it uh, it feeds it in values from it brings basically your table into your your variable scope um, with the values assigned to 
to them. So like if I run, have a look at the aerodromes, the, pardon me, the lines table again here is what that one was. Um, this expression aerodromes equals string ex extract x blah blah will be evaluated in an environment where page is assigned to the vector of page values, line is assigned to the vector of line values, chunk is assigned to the vector of value of chunk values. So this is a vectorized expression is what it's supposed to do. So part of the cleanup that the tidyverse people did in providing their own string functions is they made them all work consistently as vectorized functions, which lets you just use them inside this here. I mean, R has functions for this, but whether they work with vectors or not and those sort of details, they, you have to do some fledging and to get them to fit in in all cases. So um, a lot of tidyverse pre, pre provides a bunch of functions which are almost identical to the R functions, but um, they work cleanly in the vector environment of these evaluations. Um, oh, and the inner join, yes, we talked about that already. So you got your joins the two where you have to have a matching on the left and the right. The two lines have to have had a match between them. Let's go look at our next one. Um, so we're going to assign items to the aerodromes by the cut lines. Uh, so basically, these are our cut lines here. And we're going to, we, what, what we want to do is we want to associate everything underneath here with the aerodrome CPE2. And then if there's another aerodrome in here, we'd want to associate it with whatever its code was. Everything under here with the aerodrome CNS4 and stuff. Um, so that's an example of a join. It's a little more of an interesting join though. Uh, so let's have a look at our pages table. Our pages table, if you remember right, was just basically the page with a rough uh, assignment of line and chunk, just based on on uh, on them sharing sort of the same y value, puts them on the same line, and uh, them having a separation of less than, I think it was two times the height or something, or one times the height, then they are assumed to be part of the same chunk. So this would be a chunk, ref would be a chunk. Uh, thick in London maybe would be a chunk. I don't know, there's no sort of knowledge in there. Uh, but it was enough to, to bring in sort of the initial analysis we wanted to do here. Um, so we're going to take the pages and we're going to jump join that with our aerodromes code again here. Um, we've modified our aerodromes code here now. So it contains our, our Y location. Um, so we're just going to be taking the page, the aerodrome and the Y this time. So page, aerodrome and Y. Um, so this one here. And we're going to do an inner join, which has to have a match on both sides, but we're going to use a, a sort of unique feature. We're going to actually specify the join this time. So if you don't specify the join, it just looks for columns that have the same names. And it also prints, I believe it prints a warning um, because that's not a real safe thing to do in production code. The reason being because the column names actually came from the CSV file, right, that we imported. Um, so you don't want... <laughs> Your, the, what your code is doing, matching on matching column names to depend on the input files, right? If someone happens to provide different input files with, with column names, additional column names that match, um, then I'm not going to be happy with what happens inside my inner join. So there is a bit of a difference between production code and exploration code. Uh, so anyways, we're joining by, so matching page number, and then this is the interesting thing. This is joins the closest uh, Y0 to y, so y0 being the upper left hand, upper upper part of these, so that like the upper part of ref, for example, um, that line there to the to the cut line here y. So that would be one cut line. If we had another one down here, we would have had another cut line here. Um, so in this particular case, y0 uh, would not be greater than this one, so that would not be considered a valid join. Uh, but if I did have an item down here, then uh, this one is greater, and it's also greater than this. But in this case, since I've specified this closest operator, it's going to, uh, in this case, it would go with this one. And in this case, it goes with this one. Um, so that's a little more sophistication than you can normally get from a join. Um, these particular join products are called, uh, uh, so let's just go look at join inner. 
sorry, inner join. Need the help here. Um, so as it says, if if you don't specify it, it performs a natural join using all variables in common. But you can also use this join by operation, um, which is a, a special quoter uh, in in R. So it it uh, it takes its input and it constructs uh, stuff that does different sort of things. Um, that's the, the sort of ability to to actually access um, some of the source code in the R functions is which enables me not have to quote a bunch of names and stuff like that. Um, so anyways, so they allow you to express, you've got equality, inequality, you have these rolling helpers where you'd have uh, basically more than one. This lets you collapse that down. And then you have some overlapping helpers too. So you can have two columns specifying a range that match against another one. Um, so they cover some of the, the uh, the ones that normally you would have to do a larger join and then group and filter your data down to the subset you wanted in a, sing, a simple statement. Um, so, I mean, without this closest operation, I could just join these two here um, and then I'd get multiple hits when they shared the same page and then I could group them and then I could order them according to however I wanted to order them and then I could take the first one. But that here lets me do it all concisely in one bit of, bit of code. Um, so let's just run this, have a look at what page it is afterwards. Um, and basically, sorry, it's items. I signed it items, not the pages. Um, items is pages with now an aerodome assigned to each particular item. So I've now associated each bit of each bit of text in here with an actual aerodome, which is, is you know, now we're starting to actually get back some of the structure we were talking about. Um, and then I just remove these pages from my set of, of uh, these items from my set of larger pages. Again, going to that thing where at some point I want to actually look at what I threw out, right, just to make sure there's nothing important in there. Uh, so now we're going to actually work on some of the structuring inside here. And how do we do that? Well, oh, sorry. I'm so used to the floating mouse, there we go. So I have to click to get my focus. So I'm just gonna take off this sort of markup I put on here. Not two. Uh, we're gonna split the pay, this bit of information. Oh, I have to put back on my pen. There we go. And the logical way here is we just drop a line down here because stuff to the left, we visually know is the headers, the stuff on the right is the sort of information. Um, so we just take our items, we split it if x1 is less than our split point, which I happen to just look up by seeing how many points. This is all PDF units, so it's points. So it's, uh, it's at 72 points per inch or something like that. Um, so anyways, if it's on the left side of 74, then it's an, a label. If it's on the right side, then it's information about that label. So simple code to run. Let's jump down to the next point here. Uh, and we can have a look at what that did, of course, just to verify that it worked well. Um, so here's our labels, and we can see they match up ref, op, flight pan, uh, pick, heli data, lightning, com. And then here's our particular items. Here, so we could just got the words of text from this side here. Um, so now we want to actually build up the labels into their their parts. And I mean, you'd almost be fooled into believing that they they are good, but if you just try and use them as they are, again, the data wrangling pain, you will rapidly discover there are issues. Um, so what I did with them here as I arrange them by page and by one location. So basically a global sorting as to where they appear first in the document. Um, and then I group them by aerodome and by page. So basically all of CPEs two will be together. And again, that's because you can actually have multiple aerodomes on the same page. And then we did this line thing. So we've just discussed how this worked in the prior thing, but I'll just go over it again. Um, this is kind of a, a clever little 
pack, I was pretty pleased when I first uh, came up with it and saw how, how, how short it was. So I'll just add a print statement here. Um, and equals, uh, we'll just print, I would say, I think I can get away with printing seven lines. Have it still fit on the page. And I'll run this first without the cumulative sum. So here we do. We take our labels, we arrange our sort our data first by page and then by Y1. So that's a global uh, sort by where it occurs first. Um, and then we group that into clusters to run our individual commands on, the next following individual commands on by the aerodome and the page number. So each aerodome and each page gets its own uh, separate run. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate this line value. Now the line value is equal to, so if we to look at the Y1 location, so let's have a look at say uh, this one here, this will have a Y1 location at the bottom of it. And we look at the previous items Y1 location. Uh, okay, that was a particularly bad example. Let me have a look at this one here. So this one will have a Y1 location and this one will have a Y1 location. So if, if this one minus this one um, is greater than four, uh, so that's four points for, so four seventy seconds of an inch, um, then this is going to be true. Otherwise it's gonna be false. Um, and the very first one here, this replace NA, or sorry, the, the comma true here um, deals with the first line not having a previous value. So in this case, we also return true. So, uh, so anytime there's a spacing of greater than four between words, we set this value to true. And we'll be able to see that here when we run this. Um, so you can see, as I said, the first one is true. That's what the default value provided there is. Um, and then the next one is true. And then flight is true because it's separated from OPR by more than four. Plan is false because it's not separated from flight, the Y locations by more than four. Um, FIC will be true again, HELI will be true. Uh, data, of course, is not separated from HELI by more than four, so it is false as well. Um, and then what we do, Yeah, so the replace, so the, sorry, the first one here, Y1 minus leg Y1. So the first one returns a, an NA value because um, there is no prior value. So this here just replaces it with true, which is how I got the true in the first point. I was saying something about default, but that was wrong. That was the replaced by NA. So, and then I just run a cumulative sum on them. So again, they, this is all vector statements inside here, if you remember right. So for the aerodome and the page, this, the, all this data is passed in as a vector, which is part of the reason tidyverse is, is so fast because everything's done in vector operations. As long as you're not grouping by things that break everything out into like one items, you're gonna be quick. Um, so for these ones here, I sum up this value. Uh, well, now true is one, it converts to one, an integer false converts to zero. So this will be one and then a cumulative sum, two, three, false is zero. So that stays three, four, five, and then this stays five. And you can see uh, basically every time there's a true is telling me to increment the line number. Print that out. And you can see exactly what I said here. One, two, three, three. So flight and plan are on the same line. Four, five, five, heli and data are on the same line. Um, so then we have the line number. So we regroup things by page line and the X location, X zero, location. So now we're looking at the uh, the, the left-hand corner here. So we're, so everything that's considered to be on the same line, like flight and plan, now it'll be arranged. So flight is ahead of plan. Um, I didn't really trust the Y values. To, I mean, ideally they'd be the same, but sometimes, you know, the fonts will have a little bit of a character hanging down or something like that. So you can't uh, adjust by that. Um, and then we're grouping by the page and the line. So everything on the same line becomes together. And then we run a summarize function. So summarize is, is basically vector reduction. Um, so these are this is a mutate, if you will, 
Um, but the stuff like string flatten and stuff like that do a, a reduction of the vector. They just, I mean, it's a vector of strings, so it just squishes them all together. So flight plan will be its own vector there. It'll get squished together, separated by a space. So we'll wind up with a string flight space plan. Um, and then we calculate the bounding boxes off these vector operations. So summarize um, basically expects its arguments to all return sort of scalars. That's what uh, we should have. So let's just run this whole thing here. Now you can see basically what we've done is we've sucked those those bits together. So flight plan has been joined as we want. Heli data has been joined as we want, and so on and so forth on all our stuff. And I should point out, I mean, this is pretty fast, right? We're working with five thousand rows, and and you can see the printing is the slow part. Um, and now we're going to do our next operation. And there are labels, as it turns out, um, that have have there's some some various artifacts in our labels. Um, one of which is, let me see what I'm doing here. Right. There are split labels, and there are uh, continued labels. Right, okay, I jumped down too far. I was thinking those columns don't exist. Um, so let's let's set up for computing which labels are split first. So painfully enough, um, some of these labels, if you go through down here, the word was too long to actually fit in it. So they put a dash on the end and then they continued it on the next line. So we have to clean that up as well. And again, that's something I didn't discover because you don't look at all you know, 400 and some pages until you, you have, you've done it. Um, so let's have a look at some of these. So let's just filter our uh, labels. And again, I could pipe labels into the filter function and not provide it as the first argument. But when it's just a single one, it's not bad. You 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 use the pipe when you want to bust apart that huge, ugly nesting of the first argument on all the other arguments. Um, so yeah, so filter. Let's filter our labels. And what we're looking for here is a string filter. Labels. Uh, we're going to use the string detect function, uh, and we're going to basically take a look at the text, and we want something that has ends in a dash. So this is a reg expression, regular expression. So dash and the dollar sign means the end of the line. Um, and we can see some examples. So restrictions. So if we will go have a look on page two hundred and twelve. Um, down here somewhere, yes, restrictions is broken across a multiple line. Um, so we have to basically collect these back together. And so the way I did that here was I used a case statement, it gives me uh, a reason to show a vectorized case statement, which is pretty cool. Uh, R has a built-in case statement, but it's not a vectorized one. Um, so if you wanted to use it, you'd have to, you know, define it as a separate function and then do a map and then it would get called all the time instead of in a nice vectorized fast format. So anyway, so case when, so when we are uh, x0 is near the aerodome x0. So if we jump, well, actually I can just mark up this page here. Uh, x0 here was basically the left-hand side of this. It's one of the constants of this routine. So when x is near, when the left-hand side of this um, is near the x0, uh, is separated by less than 4, then we assign it the value 1. Otherwise, we assign it the value 2. Uh, so there's two sort of things going on here. And I'm, I'm sorry, I was talking about the second one. So there's two types of labels. There's level 1 labels, and then there's level 2 labels. So this particular case statement is differentiating between level one labels, so where the left-hand side starts against here, and level two labels where it doesn't. 
Um, so basically, we're assigning the level variable to one or two, depending on uh, whether we are um, which, which one of these cases are. So we can quickly run that too. That's easy to, to see here. I'll just throw a print in here. And equals, well, print out eight lines, say seven lines. Um, so here we got level uh, ref OPR flight plan is one, and then FIC is our first example of uh, uh, this is going back on page one, so 212. So let's just jump back to page three for now. Um, so this is our first level two label, um, and so on and so forth. Back to page 212 now. Uh, so and well, I must say too, this is an, an example of one here, one of the bigger ones, Kitchener Waterloo. We've got a bigger picture for starters, so our pictures are not regular. And this actually spans multiple pages, right? Because Kitchener is a bigger, uh, a bigger airport. So that's some of the other stuff we'll have to deal with. Um, so now that we've assigned levels to them, we arrange them by the page and the line. Um, again, we group them by the aerodrome and their level. So and then we, we basically pull a cum sum uh, trick again. So we look for um, text where the previous text ended with a dash. Uh, and where that's false, uh, then we do a, a not. So basically, well, let's actually just print out what kind of value, because sometimes thinking through the, let's uh, um, so sort of the cum sum there. And I'm just going to make a copy of that line instead. Of, it's actually got a text part on it too. So we'll strip out the cum sum. There we go. Uh, we'll drop the second part of the assignment. And we will pipe this too. We need a pipe after the print statement. And then we'll do a final print here, which will be the last thing. So we'll print after that. All right. Uh, yes. So each of these is assigned a true value because the prior text before it did not end in a dash. Something where the prior text before it did end in a dash is assigned a false value, of which we have to go down a long ways in the file, have to get to page 212 to see one of those. Um, now, what, what this is going to do is if I accumulate some of this, each one, each thing that doesn't, if, if it doesn't end in a dash, the next one's going to get a new number. So basically, I'm going to assign the same number to res restrict uh, the Sean's will get the same number as restriction because this prior, prior, prior one ended in a dash. Um, so I'm going to have created a variable that I can then group by um, that will have things like restrictions assigned the same number, but everything else assigned its own unique number. And then I also uh, strip the, the, uh, the, the ending dash out of it, because when I join these together with text here, so string remove, um, again, mat using a regular expression and it removes the match, uh, I will want to join these and I won't want the dash left in the word. So let's actually see how this works. Um, and there we can see. So each one gets its own unique, uh, what was it here? Did we assign its own unique item number? Um, of course, within the group, it, it was it was belonged to. So they were they were grouped by uh, what was it, aerodrome and level. Um, and then if we jump forward to page two hundred and twelve, we would actually see. Well, I mean, we can do that if we want. So let's filter labels uh, by page equals two twelve. 
and then let's print out that there's probably quite a few of these and we'll print out say 50 lines of text of the table um, and hopefully yes so here we can see restrictions um, was assigned the same item number which will then let me put those in the same group and then I can summarize them and join them which is what brings us down to this next section at top here which is basically we group by their dome the level and the item number and then surprise surprise we flatten the text and of course we uh, if the text happens to be on separate lines, so if it happens that restrict one to one and the shuns on the next line, um, we can we will we calculate a page number being the first of the page numbers. Uh, and we you notice we didn't group by page in here, um, so we can handle split across pages, and we assign the page to be the first of the pages and the line to be the first of the page, and then we compute the uh, bounding box. I guess technically if they were split across multiple pages, that bounding box would be really screwed up, but uh, I didn't actually use it again. And then finally, there's a few here that have this cont D. Um, so if we filter our text here, tables, text, string, detect. Let's have a look at our text here. We're going to detect this string uh, cont. There we go. Uh, we have one case here on page 438. So I'm just going to remove my markings I did on this page here. We go and jump down to page 438. So this is why I wound up carrying the page numbers through everything, because it was provided so immensely useful um, when I was looking at it. So in this particular one here, pro was continued onto the next page. So they repeated it with CONTD after. Uh, most of the multiple page ones do not do that that the title is continued on to the next page and there's just no label here, right? For whatever reason, um, the Billy Bishop, I guess Toronto's special, right? <laughs> they got their own con. So we pulled that one out to make it the same as all the others. And again, that's an example of, you know, when I was all done, I went and looked at my labels. I'm like, what? What's this one doing in here? Because there's just like one exception in the entire file. Um, so we also yanked that out of our list of labels. Let's have a look at our final labels. Um, there we go. Let's have a look at our labels there on page 212. Uh, we can see we have put restrictions back together. So that's good. And uh, if we did here, if we do a filter, um, we can see there's none that have, we got rid of the cont one as well. So exactly what we wanted to do. Um, so then the next thing we do is we assign the items to, oh, so let's have a look here. So dplyr case when, yeah, so that's the vectorized case where I get a little uh, string remove. So that was an interesting new function on the stringer library um, that, of course, matches a regular expression and removes the regular express, the match portion of the regular expression from it. Um, and these particular, like these string match functions and stuff like that, you can also do subgrouping and then you can pass a group equals argument to it and, and it'll just uh, act on that particular uh, group. Um, okay, so. Now we wanted to handle the, the nested labels. So if we go back to page three here, um, we had flight plan and we had FIC. Uh, so, and as if we have basically two levels of, of labels, we have assigned those labels. If we have a look at our labels, we've assigned a level, have we assigned a level? Yes, we've assigned a level to them. So we got FIC and AG being on level two and the other ones. And that was just based on the left hand uh, where if it was left hand aligned or not. Um, so we're going to use the pivot wider function again, and the pivot the pivot functions um, basically take your table. So there's there's some data you can prevent you can present as like uh, as as columns or row variables, and you can sort of mesh around into as to how you you perform it. Um, there's an ideal form for data analysis called uh, tidy data. Uh, done by S is sort of the, the database languages that say data should be structured in a particular way. Um, but for analysis, it's often advantage to work with wider or narrower data. So a tidyverse provides pivot wider 
and pivot, um, what's the other one? I want to say pivot smaller or pivot wider, uh, pivot longer. So the one makes a longer table and the other one makes a wider table. So it's just going to take some separate rows and it's going to combine them into a single row. And you use that function because all these operations are row-wise or group-wise. So if I want to combine information across multiple rows, uh, one thing I can do is put them into the same row, uh, and then I can apply a row-wise operation. So this is what we're going to do here. How do we pivot this wider? Um, well, what we're doing here is we're going to take the, the level column, um, and we are going to combine these rows that only differ in their level column. And, uh, and the particular values we're going to look at is text. So when we pivot this wider, so let's have an example here. Um, say these, this one here and this one here have a different level value. I mean, they have different other values as well, so they won't actually work. But if they just differed by their level value, uh, then we could put them both on the same row by having a text uh, item one and a text item two, right? Uh, and then all the other values are the same, so we only need one copy of that. So by, by in introducing a text one and a text two column, um, we can collapse the lines that match everywhere except for their value of level, which becomes whether it's with the first value winds up in the first column and the second value winds up in the second column. Uh, let's just put some print statements in here so you can actually see better what this does. So, and we'll just print out, uh, say, seven lines, I think. I can print out two groups of seven lines and keep it on the same page. So I don't want to overwrite my labels variable. So separate that across. Uh, OK. So this is what we had before. We had an items column. Uh, the items column is gone because that's been incorporated into the column names. And so now we have a label one and a label two. So label one is the text value when the when the level was one. Label two is the text value when the level was two. So that has enabled us to combine them. Uh, in this case here, and everything, so everything you don't mention in your pivot statement uh, basically becomes the grouping operation because those, those values have to uh, be the same in order to collapse the lines. So this one here has no matches uh, uh, for a level two. So we've got a bunch of NAs. Um, let's print some more rows there. Let's do a regular print statement. Um, and here's ones that are, have a label two, and they don't have any matches for a label one. Uh, label one, And that's just because uh, this particular example we're looking here. Oops. So three. If we look at this here, um, oh, I need an annotation. There we go. There we go. The uh, the Y location and stuff are these these are not on the same line at all. Um, and I have a bunch of other variables in here x zero x one y zero which are not going to match up as well because there are different locations on the page. Uh, but it basically it meant I've now got label one and label two on the separate things. Um, and then what I do is I, I abuse this um, by, I arrange my page, my arrange by page and line. So I sort by page and line, and then I apply, limit myself to an arrow dome, um, and I fill in label one. So I sort this all here by the line number. And then what the fill does is anywhere there's an NA value, it gets the value, the last good value and fills it in. So basically I'm going to copy pro, will get copied down into this line. Um, so I'm, I'm, let me see, pro, what data am I looking at here? Page three. Okay, yeah, this is not sorted uh, according to the, one, the ones I want, but it's going to take flight plan and copy it down to the FIC label, and it's going to take com and talk, cop, copy it down to the AG label when I've got this properly sorted. So let's... um. Move these print statements down here a bit. We'll put them before the fill statement, and we'll put them after this fill statement. Here, uh, print seven lines before, print seven lines after the fill. Um, and it doesn't really matter if I run that bit or not, but let's not run it. 
and you can see what happened here. Um, so originally, uh, FIC here was missing a value, but in our sorted world, uh, flight plan was above it. So that value got copied down and so on. So basically, um, I've taken, there was an implicit first level label to every second level label. So I've now manipulated the data to identify what the first level label, what that implicit label is. So now, now in our data, there's some that don't have a second level one, such as the flight plan NOTAM file CY0 is that. And then the flight information center here, the flight plan flight information center belongs to this bit of text. Uh, so I've, 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 I've made it explicit what the level one is in all cases, and uh, and then the level two as well. Um, and then here's some other fun here. So then we, after that, we ungroup it. So we just, uh, so that, uh, that makes it the whole table as well. And then uh, this here, we've done a keep equals none. So what that does by default, keep is all. Um, and I should add to most of the tidyverse functions now that take this sort of generic stuff, they start their own specific arguments with a dot function. And that helps avoid them conflict with any of the names in your table. So you don't want to you know, name one of your columns dot something, because then that'll conflict with actual arguments passed into tidyverse. So keep equals none says don't keep any of the information um, any of the values except for the ones specifically mentioned. So error dome equals error dome. If you don't specify what it is, it's just equals. And that's just a way of saying, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep page. Um, to page equals page. And then this is kind of a cool rock, or, uh, option here too. So the mutate um, language, if you will, that lets you run these things. It's got stuff like across. So this is, takes it across. So all lines that start with the word label. So that'll be label one and label two. Um, then apply the factor function. So the factor function basically turns us into an enumerated variable instead of a text variable. Um, so it just goes through, it sorts these, and instead of each one being flight plan a string, it'll be assigned a number, and then that number will be associated with the word flight plan. So that reduces the size of my data, it makes comparisons quicker, it lets me easily see you know, how many different values there are for label one. I just look at what the enumeration values are and stuff like that. So Factors are a nice way of working with a limited set of strings, such as the labels or the aerodome codes and stuff like that. Um, now, each item, I want to associate a unique key uh, in order to have it in, to re refer to another table. So I just assign it to the row number. Um, and then finally, I calculate a Y value for each of these uh, by just erase, removing four. If remember, four is my magic fudge factor to deal with the fact that uh, stuff doesn't always line up. So let's run this here. Put this all back onto one line. Um, so basically we got what we had said here, we got our aerodome, our item, our unique item number identifies each particular item in the file. Um, we were ungrouped before, so that's consistent across the entire file. We've got a page associated with them. We got their, their labels, their label one and their label two, if there's a second level label. And then we got a Y cutoff value, which is the, the bottom of this moved up slightly. So we can use that Y value, of course. We're gonna look across here um, and we're going to match up the bits of text that's on the other side. Uh, so all the particular items we discussed, which are new, is we have the fill function, um, which fills in missing values. And we have the across function, which gives it a slightly more example of how you can apply um, sort of functions based on matching labeling names. Uh, and we have the starts with, um, which is another stringer function, or sorry, Selection helper, yes, yeah, sorry. So this is this is a way of matching labels. If you look up across, there's a bunch of different ways you can match labels, ends with, starts with, stuff like that. So this matches the, the labels based on what it starts with. Um, and it looks like I have ran out of time yet again. This seems to be a very huge example. So uh, I'm gonna stop at this point and see if there's any questions. I guess we'll have to do a third talk to get through it all. <laughs>